Today's video is sponsored by Raycon. 2024 has arrived, and a new year brings new goals. Personally, mine's to get back in shape, and thankfully, I have the perfect buds to keep me motivated. Raycon's Everyday Earbuds, my compact and crystal clear audio companions that look, feel, and sound better than ever. When it comes to training, there's no better option. Raycon's optimized gel tips ensure a snug in-ear fit that stays put no matter how active your lifestyle. And trust me, these things don't budge, and they remain comfortable even after extended usage. Speaking of which, they come with an impressive 8 hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life. They're loaded with features too, including 3 customizable sound profiles which elevate any workout playlist. If I'm out listening to Outcast, I'll use bass sound. If I'm feeling more Black Sabbath, I'll swap over to balance sound. And for my history podcast, I use pure sound. Want to hear what's going on around you? With a simple tap, you can seamlessly switch between noise isolation mode and awareness mode. Click the link in the description box, or go to buyraycon.com forward slash masquerade to get 15% off your Raycon purchase, plus free shipping. Support the channel, reach your goals, and get your pair today. In this digital age of romance, where connections are made and tossed aside with a single swipe, apps like Tinder have gone from new and exciting to completely accepted and ordinary. But as I've said in the past, when it comes to strangers on the internet, can you ever truly know who you're interacting with, laughing with, and planning to meet up with? Social, adventurous, and full of life, 21-year-old Grace Mullane was a young Briton with a bright future. Having just graduated from the University of Lincoln with a bachelor's degree in advertising and marketing, Grace decided that before beginning her career, she wanted to take a gap year and see as much of the world as possible. She set off on her year-long adventure on October 26, 2018, travelling from London's Heathrow Airport to Lima, Peru. She spent six weeks exploring South America, the first leg of her journey. On November 20th, she embarked on the second, a trip around Oceania. After exploring the North Island of New Zealand, she made her way to Auckland on November 30th, where both her trip and life were cruelly cut short. After checking into the base backpackers hostel on Queen Street, Grace socialised with other travellers before settling into her bunk and browsing Tinder. After swiping through several profiles, she matched with a man who sparked her curiosity, Jesse Kempson, a 26-year-old from Wellington. After some flirtatious back and forth, the two agreed to meet on the following day, on Saturday, December 1st, one day before Grace's 22nd birthday. On December 2nd, Grace's nearest and dearest sent her text messages and voicemails, wishing her a happy birthday and asking how her trip was going. She didn't reply to any of them. That was unusual. Grace was an avid social media user and stayed in daily contact with her family sending them photos and videos, and generally keeping them updated about her whereabouts and plans. Her parents attempted to call her on both her primary and backup mobile phones. Both immediately went to voicemail. After several days of radio silence, they began to worry that something had happened to their daughter, and on December 5th, they contacted the authorities in Auckland and reported her missing. Her father, David, flew from London to New Zealand and sat with investigators as they held a press conference to raise awareness about Grace's vanishing. It was around this time that detectives turned their attention to the innumerable high-quality CCTV cameras that lined the buildings of New Zealand, and amazingly, the authorities were able to track Grace's movements on the eve of her birthday, practically from beginning to end. December 1st. At 5.37pm, Grace was seen leaving the base backpackers hostel and making her way from Queen Street to Sky City where she had agreed to meet her Tinder date, Jesse Kempson. The pair greeted each other with a hug outside the entrance, and made their way to Andy's, a bar and grill on the second floor, where they spent an hour and a half drinking. From Andy's, Grace and Jesse made their way to the Mexican Café, another bar and restaurant in Sky City.
After 70 minutes, they made their way to their third destination, the Bluestone Room, arriving at exactly 8.36pm. When Jessie got up to use the bathroom, Grace sent her final text message to a close friend back in the UK. I clicked with him so well. At one point, when Grace left the table, Jessie was filmed rifling through her bag. With things becoming increasingly intimate, the pair decided to go back to Jessie's hotel, where he lived full time. They arrived at the City Life Hotel at 9.40pm, entered the elevator, and stepped out onto the third floor. This is the lost footage of Grace Mullane, alive. On the morning of December 2nd, as friends and family were wishing Grace a happy 22nd birthday, Jesse Kempson was again caught on CCTV, exiting room 308, alone. At just after 8am, he made his way into the Elliott Street warehouse and purchased a new suitcase. He then went to a separate store called the Countdown Metro and bought cleaning supplies before returning to his hotel room at 8.15. After placing the newly purchased items inside, he again made his way down to the lobby, caught a taxi driven by one, Surinder Kumar, and went to Apex Car Hire to rent a red Toyota hatchback. Unbelievably, at 4pm that same day, Jesse then made his way to another bar and met another woman for a Tinder date in Ponsonby. According to this woman, Jesse was very intense, quite calm though. This woman, who was a former journalist, casually mentioned a murder trial which she had once attended. This prompted Jesse to reply, It's crazy how guys can make one wrong move and go to jail for the rest of their life. Feeling creeped out by his demeanour, she ended their date early and went home, leaving Jesse with plenty of time on his hands. He took this opportunity to return to the hotel and borrowed a carpet steam cleaner from the front desk telling them that he had to remove a red wine stain. After spending an hour inside his room, he again returned to the lobby to borrow a luggage cart, which he brought back up and loaded with his newly purchased suitcase. He took this luggage out to his rented car, loaded it inside, and drove off. At 6.55am on December 3rd, Jesse made his way to a hardware store and bought himself a brand new spade before returning to the hotel at 9. An hour later, he exited his room with a full bin bag and disposed of its contents in a trash can outside. He then had some clothes and subsequently his rented car cleaned at the Mint Dry Cleaners and the Warehouse St. Luke's respectively. Jesse really believed that he had thought of everything. What he hadn't counted on were all of the electronic eyes that had been watching his every move. At 4.42pm on December 5th, Jesse was again caught on CCTV disposing of even more rubbish in an Albert Park bin. On December 6th, he left his hotel for the final time at 8.43pm. At 2.19pm, Jesse tried to return unaware that officers were already inside the lobby looking for him. He notices them at the front desk and makes his escape. but not before being seen himself. He was swiftly apprehended and brought in for questioning. 
During his interview, Jesse got to explain how his date with Grace unfolded. Tell us about Grace. Uh, so I was talking to Grace on Tinder. Yeah. Um, we'd matched on Friday. I saw that we'd matched um, the next day on the Saturday. How did the evening pan out? Sam? Um, yeah, pretty good. How did the evening sort of come to an end? Uh, there was a hug and a kiss on the cheek um, and a thanks, no, nice meeting you. Um, and then I said, let me know about tomorrow. What he didn't realise was that his version of events didn't match up with the CCTV footage. And yet, despite having so much evidence stacked against him, there was still no concrete proof that Grace, who was still considered missing, was deceased. Following this interview, investigators obtained a search warrant for Jesse's City Life hotel room. Despite his attempts to scrub away the evidence of his actions, the forensic team discovered a substantial amount of Grace's blood hidden in the carpet. On December 7th, Jesse was brought back in for questioning. Realising that investigators had likely found proof that Grace had died in his room, this time he changed his story. He now claimed that he and Grace had a Fifty Shades style encounter. Though his memory of that night was hazy, he claimed that things got intense in the bedroom, and after the pair had finished, he went to take a shower, during which he fell asleep. He said that after waking up and returning to the bedroom, he found Grace unresponsive on the floor and attempted to revive her. After formally being charged, investigators searched Jesse's phone. This turned up some truly horrifying evidence. Not only had Jesse taken photos of Grace before disposing of her, manipulating her body to get the shots that he wanted, but he had also used Google in the hours and days after she had perished, searching the phrases, flesh-eating birds, are there vultures in New Zealand, the hottest fire, large bags near me, and crucially, Waitakere Ranges, a mountainous area west of Auckland. Following his GPS signal, New Zealand authorities were able to trace all of Jesse's movements after the slaying. This, paired with his search history, led them to the Waitakere Ranges. There, buried in a hole in the bushland, they found Grace's body, still inside the suitcase. Experts determined that her COD was strangulation. According to prosecutors, such a method takes at least 5 to 10 minutes. According to Jesse's message history, he had told other matches on Tinder that he enjoyed feet, dominating, and strangulation. Initially, New Zealand courts imposed a suppression order on Jesse Kempson's name, prohibiting its publication. Several international media outlets opted to defy that court order and publish Jesse's name, running the risk of causing a mistrial. Thankfully, that didn't come to pass. Though Jesse's defence team stuck with the narrative that Grace perished after a night of consensual misadventure, effectively placing the blame largely on her, Jesse Kempson was ultimately found guilty of her slaying and sentenced to life with a minimum non-parole period of 17 years. Jesse reportedly yelled at the judge, You have no reason to convict me. I can't wait for the Court of Appeal to overturn you, mate. You're full of shit. His appeal was later rejected. Jesse later received a further 11 years behind bars when two other women, including another British backpacker, came forward and reported that Jesse had SA'd them while holding a knife to their throats. Those 11 years are to be served concurrently with the 17 he had already been given. During Jesse's initial trial, Grace's father, David, was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It unfortunately claimed his life in November 2020. This case was brought to my attention after I watched a video made by Stay Awake, so I thought it would be good to give his channel a shout out. If you like true crime documentaries that are concise and well presented, and which feature plenty of audio and video evidence themselves, then check out Stay Awake's channel via the link in my description. It's some really great stuff and worth your time. This is Dr. Emmett Volton, a 69-year-old psychologist who lived and worked in Phoenix, Arizona, where he maintained a private practice at 2323 North Central Avenue. Described as a kind-hearted person who loved to help people, 
Emmett had assisted countless patients with his cognitive behavioural therapy techniques. He co-authored books on recovery and ageing, taught at universities, and gave hundreds of public speeches across the US on how to handle the problems of everyday living. While openly gay, Emmett remained private about his relationships, seldom discussing his dating experiences with his friends and colleagues, and rarely revealing any details about his personal life. Those closest to him described Emmett as the ultimate listener, much more interested in hearing about other people than talking about himself. And it's that reserved aspect of his personality that's made this next case all the more difficult to solve. April 24th, 2011. Easter Sunday, and the last day of Dr. Emmett Belton's life. At 8.10am, Emmett was captured on CCTV, parking his Toyota RAV4 in a bay outside his apartment complex, described online as near 2020 North Central Avenue, the same block as his office. Both he and an unknown male passenger exited the vehicle, and walked side by side into the building. Surveillance footage from inside the apartment's elevator showed both men talking to one another in an ostensibly relaxed manner. They entered Emmett's apartment together. Two hours later, the unidentified passenger left the apartment alone, descended the stairwell, and crossed the parking lot in a very nonchalant fashion. He then stole Emmett's car and casually fled the scene. Emmett emerged from his apartment shortly thereafter, blood streaming from his head with his pants partially lowered. He crawled towards the elevator before collapsing on the floor. A concerned neighbour discovered him and promptly contacted emergency services. Emmett was still alive and conscious when officers arrived, and he was able to provide some crucial details about his assailant. In his final moments, Emmett explained that he had picked the man up from Cass, a homeless shelter in downtown Phoenix that offers mental health and support services. After stepping into the apartment, the unknown passenger had bound Emmett's legs and furiously attacked him. It seems Emmett failed to tell the officers the man's name. Paramedics rushed him to the hospital, but unfortunately, Emmett lost consciousness en route and was pronounced DOA. Although Emmett hadn't revealed his killer's identity, the authorities were confident that it was only a matter of time before they tracked him down. Not only did they have Emmett's final testimony to work with, but they also had three separate camera angles of the man entering the apartment complex. But after browsing through the footage, the detectives became disheartened. The man's face was too pixelated to make out, and frustratingly, he never squarely faced the lens. This unidentified passenger was characterised as a slender Caucasian male, neatly groomed with an approximate height of 5 foot 9. He carried a tan messenger bag and wore a neon green baseball cap, a white t-shirt, and dark trousers. As for physical evidence, a distinct bloody footprint was found inside Emmett's apartment, and items like door handles, an electrical cord, and an empty beer bottle were submitted for DNA and fingerprint testing. The results came back. No matches. Officers began scouring local homeless shelters in search of anyone matching the unidentified passenger's description. They showed the surveillance video to regulars at the shelters, but no one could identify the man in the footage. Despite having been picked up at Cass, it is a distinct possibility that the passenger wasn't a homeless person after all. A photo lineup was shown to the front desk attendant at Emmett's apartment complex, but they didn't recognise any of the faces shown to them. Emmett had no known history of hiring escorts or cruising the streets looking for hookups, and both scenarios seemed unlikely, though not impossible, at 8am. He also had no enemies to speak of, at least, none that he had ever mentioned. It's very possible that the passenger wasn't a local, said Phoenix detective Dominic Rustenberg. Other than the video, we don't have anything on him. Online sources are unclear as to whether Emmett's apartment and office were actually one and the same, so it's also worth considering whether the passenger was one of his private patients, or someone he was helping in his spare time. As well as his identity being a mystery, the perp's motive is equally shrouded in uncertainty. The passenger hadn't stolen anything from the apartment, and Emmett's car was found three days after the incident, abandoned on 35th Avenue and Glendale, a rough area about 14 miles north of the apartment. Security guards had noticed it there the same morning that Emmett was slain, but didn't immediately report it. In the minds of investigators, whoever took Emmett's life did so for either personal reasons or for their own pleasure. 
since Emmett passed out before he could tell officers the man's name or the purpose of their meeting, all we can do is watch over the Siri footage and speculate. The thing that strikes me, and many other viewers, is just how calmly the passenger leaves the scene of the murder, almost as if he felt justified in his actions, almost as if he knew he was going to get away with it. We can only hope he doesn't. But with almost 13 years having now passed, with no concrete leads to speak of, the odds, unfortunately, seem stacked in his favour. Meta Price Valentine, otherwise known as Mimi, was a 43-year-old mother from Fayetteville, North Carolina. A woman of faith, Meta was very involved with her local Deliverance and Praise Church of Worship on Owen Drive, where she worked as a secretary and choir director. On the evening of October 28, 2014, Meta attended a community watch meeting at that same church. Meta's pastor noted that she had been visibly fearful as of late. She would often ask fellow church members to walk her home, and would always mix up her route. It appeared as if she thought that someone was out to get her. That evening, however, Meta felt comfortable enough to make her way home alone. Surveillance cameras captured the chilling moment that she arrived back at her apartment complex on Sycamore Park. It was approximately 5.30pm. The footage shows Meta heading in the direction of her unit. She pauses briefly, and appears to focus on a car parked outside her entrance. She then picks up her pace, rounds a corner onto the breezeway, and exits the camera's field of view, at which point a man exits that same car and sprints after her. That's the last anyone saw of Meta Valentine, but not the last that anyone heard from her. Five hours after this footage was captured, at 10.30pm, Meta spoke with her mother on the phone. According to her mother, Meta was speaking in riddles and very difficult to understand. The following day, Meta was scheduled to attend a Bible study class with family and friends. When she didn't show up, her loved ones attempted to reach her over the phone but weren't able to get through to her. They immediately reported Meta missing. Officers arrived at Meta's apartment, but found no trace of her inside, nor was there any sign of a struggle within the property itself. From there, they turned their attention to the nearby surveillance cameras. After examining the footage, investigators were able to identify the man who chased after Meta, their prime suspect from the very beginning, Reginald McDowell. Meta's on and off boyfriend, and the father of one of her children. In 1999, Reginald was arrested after he bound, gagged, and pistol whipped Meta and her partner. In 2001, he was sentenced to serve 15 years behind bars, but was released early in 2011. Upon his release, he and Meta rekindled their relationship, but separated again in October 2014. That was two weeks before she disappeared. In the initial stages of the investigation, Reginald cooperated with the police, but this cooperation came to an abrupt end when he suddenly cut all contact with them and went into hiding. It wasn't until 2018 that the authorities formally filed charges against Reginald in connection with Meta's disappearance. Warrants were issued for first degree murder, but Reginald was nowhere to be found. For nigh on six years, detectives have been searching for Reginald McDowell. He hasn't been in contact with his relatives in the Fayetteville area, including the son that he had with Meta. It's believed he's currently hiding somewhere in New York City, where he reportedly has friends and family. Meta Valentine's body has never been found. We're getting close to closure, which is a great thing, said Meta's son 
the Mario Valentine. It's just hard, because I always wanted her there when I got married and had kids, and I'm hoping there's still a chance that happens. There's been quite a few cases where people pop up years later, so anything's possible. At the time of her vanishing, Meta had dyed blonde hair and was wearing coloured contact lenses, a blue t-shirt, grey sweatpants and flip-flops. If still alive, she'd be 52 years old today. A huge thank you to my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon. George Lopez, Holly Lyons, Modest Bulbasaur, Smile and Jack, Alana Pons, Asia Mina, Azriel Warakai, Cass, Chief Gochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Sai Wazau, Farewell Tattoos Jack Seffel, Gina Valera, Hamish, Ian Billock, Monica Mendoza, Peter Lodgerage, TNS Mum, Hamish K, Ellen Doloff, Itai Allon, Nefus1988, and Lydia Kumo. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. Until next time. The Devils in the Detail.